<laughs> no, we three kings. We three kings of Orient are very gifts from us afar. Feel the fountain, near a mountain, falling on star. And the chorus, do we know it? Star of wonder, star of night, star of boy of beauty bright, westward leading still grows. Perfect. Well done, guys. I see you guys suck, so, alright? <laughs> I'm only kidding, well done. We three kings of Orient are just. Written by a man called John Hopkins back in 1857. He was actually, at the bottom you can see his name there, John Hopkins. He was actually a, a man who worked for the New York Times. He was a journalist. Then he decided he wanted to be a lawyer. And then after he graduated being a lawyer, he decided he wants to join the ministry. So then after his seminary, he decided to become a minister. And he was actually appointed as a music teacher of that university that he graduated from. And he became the music teacher. At the end of his teaching career, he wrote this amazing carol, We Three Kings. Of Orient are. I've always been fascinated by stars. I love that last part there. It says, Guide us to thy perfect light. You know, there's stars. The star of Bethlehem was the star there to guide the wise men to Jesus. And during the Christmas season, there's a lot of hustle and bustle around. You see the stars. Anybody see those lights up in the middle of the streets when you drive through town? In dispatch, I was driving through and I was looking at all of them. And, and they were beautiful and they were shining. But you know what? None of them had anything to do with Jesus. Did anybody notice it? There's a lot of Santa Claus, a lot of gifts, a lot of Christmas trees, but nothing about Jesus. Not his name, not a nativity scene, not Mary or Joseph. And I thought that's so sad, but that is unfortunately the state of the world that we live in. The stars and the lights are not guiding people to Jesus. And you know, 2,000 years ago, God used the star of Bethlehem to lead wise men to Jesus. Today, He doesn't use that. You know what He uses? You and me. We are His stars today, and we should be shining brightly, leading people to Jesus. Even Jesus says Himself, let your light shine brightly among men, that men will see your good works, your good works, and that they might glorify who? God. He even says, be like stars. He even uses that same word. Shine amongst men and be like stars in the night sky. We are the star of Bethlehem. And we must lead people to Jesus. As I said, I've always had a fascination with keen interest in stars. Um, astronomy, understanding um, planets and how they move in stars. And I found out there was a theory put forward that what was the star of Bethlehem actually. And what they found out that there was a special alliance of two planets during this time. It happened about the time of Christ's birth, 2 BC. What happened was two particular planets came into conjunction with each other. The planets were Jupiter and Venus. And it's interesting that the Hebrew word for Jupiter is Chedet, which means righteousness. Jeremiah 23 says, and this is his name, which will be called the Lord our righteousness. Interesting, right? Eh? The other planet that came to conjunction was Venus. And it's commonly referred to as the morning star. Anybody know that? Venus is called the morning star. In Revelation it says, I am the root and descendant of David, the bright morning star. Isn't that interesting? These two planets aligned with each other, causing a spectacular, phenomenal, astronomical event in the skies around the time of Christ. This is probably what the wise men saw. But then I found that not only that, they also aligned themselves in the constellation of Leo, the lion. Anybody see the, the reference there? Yeah, it says in Revelation, stop reaping, behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah. The of the Isn't that interesting? Now, whether or not it was a conjunction or whether it was a supernatural light by God, I find those things very, very interesting. That the star of Bethlehem could have been that planet. And many scientists have scoffed at the idea because they've looked at the Bible and said, but the Bible says that the star stopped over Bethlehem. And anybody that has any idea of stars and planets, they do not stop because they follow their orbit around the sun. All of it. If you look at the night sky and you see the stars, they will all just follow their pattern. And they never, ever stop. But Jupiter, on the other hand, ah, that's a special planet. You know why? Jupiter has what they call retrograde process motion, which means that it actually reverses. Can you believe it? A planet goes through the sky, and then at a time, it will slow down, and you know what it will do? It will stop, and then it will reverse and go backwards. So people have put forward, these astronomers have gone up to the computer, they've got a software program, an astronomical one, well, astronomy one, rather than astronomical. And then what they've done was they, they, they found out if they take all the stars and planets that move around the sun, they have a, an ecliptic, an orbit around the sun, 
They can trace it back 2,000 years. So they've done this. They've moved the clock back all the way to 2 BC. And they found out that when this alliance took place, that's exactly what happened to Jupiter. They said that Jupiter would have went over and it would have slowed down and it would have stopped. And you know where it stopped? Over Bethlehem. Can you believe it? Science has put that forward. It stopped over Bethlehem. So you can imagine this. In the night sky, there's one of these things that stops. But! And then you know what happens? It starts to go backwards. In the night sky. It reverses itself. For many weeks it goes along the western skies. It stops again. And then goes back along this eastward route. Isn't that unbelievable? Sometimes scientists and astronomers laugh at the Bible. But sometimes they do themselves injustice because what they're doing is actually proving and confirming the Bible. So as I said, this might just be a theory. It might not have happened. This, but I think it's very, very interesting. It is the most prominent theory put forward to what the star of Bethlehem is. So today... We celebrate what? Christmas. Well done, guys, for those of you who are going away. Christmas. <laughs> for those who, who didn't answer, but didn't get any gifts. Who did not get a gift? Only me. Am I, the, was I, the, am I the only naughty boy this whole year that didn't get a gift? We celebrate Christmas, the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want us to travel back 2,000 years back in time. You and me will go right along those wise men as we follow their star of wonder, star of life, star of oil. So let's turn to our Bibles, if you have it with you. We can turn to the Matthew chapter 2 and read about the wise men and that star of wonder. Thank you, Tony. You can read for us. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judah, during the time King Herod, Maggie from the east, came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east, and they have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where, where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea they replied, For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For, for out of you will come a ruler, who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. I mean, basically, you know, so of the wise men, they call the magi. That is where we get our words magic, magician, and even magistrate. Now, I love that song, We Three Kings, but it's not technically correct because they weren't kings. The, the wise men were magicians, astrologers, prophets. They came from the land of Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia was the land of modern day Iraq and Iran. So they came from that area. They were very familiar with the scriptures and prophecies of the Jews because everybody in the world was waiting for the promised Messiah to come from out of Israel. So they were very familiar with what the Bible and scripture said about when and where Jesus, well not Jesus, the Messiah would come from. According to the book of Daniel, there's a very beautiful prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 for the 70 week prophecy. It's a prophecy that takes place over 490 years. The biggest prophecy in the Bible, 490 years. It takes place. And in this prophecy, Daniel actually predicted when Christ would come. And it said he started with the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. Remember, Jerusalem was destroyed, and then during the Persian Empire, they rebuilt the walls. So these magi, these wise men from the east, they said, okay, well, we know when this happened, historical records tell us. So we just add 483 years to it, and voila, we get when the Messiah would come. So they're very familiar with it. At the same time, what happened in the sky? Wow, an event like no other, a conjunction between Jupiter and Venus, causing the star of Bethlehem. So they saw the star going out the eastward sky all the way to Israel. So they knew this is it, man. The Messiah is coming. He's going to be born. So they went to where? To Israel. You see, they knew where, but they didn't know where to go. So they went there, and the first thing they could do was probably go to the capital city. What is the capital of Israel? Jerusalem. Well done. 10 out of 10. So they went to Jerusalem and they went to speak to the king. His name was King Herod. So they said, King, where is he, the Messiah, to be born? The king of the Jews. So he went to the king of Israel, the coming king, and said to him, where is the king of Israel going to be born? Kind of like a statement, listen, you're not really the king. The real king is coming. And where is he going to be born? Now if anybody knows the history of King Herod, he was not a good guy. He was actually a nut ball of nut. He was crazy. He killed everybody in his family that threatened the throne. He killed his mother, his father, his brother, his cousins, anybody that anything that he threw to the throne, he wiped out and eliminated. So you can imagine this man listening to these wise men saying, Listen, 
the king of the Jews is going to be born today. Do you think he was happy about it? Do you think he was happy like we are today? No, he hated the idea. How dare somebody come and threaten the throne? So they said, where is he going to be born? And you know what? Not even Herod knew. He had to call his teachers and the priests. And he said to them, listen guys, these guys from Babylon, from Mesopotamia, are telling me that the Messiah is going to be born. Is this true? They said, yes. Well, where will it happen? And then they say, according to the prophet Mackay, it will happen in Bethlehem. So you know what Herod says to them? He says, okay, wise men, go to Bethlehem and seek out this Jesus. And when you find him, come back and tell me so I can go and worship him. Do you think you're telling the truth? No. no. Is it a blatant, bloody lie? <laughs> he wanted to kill Jesus. So he said, go and find him and come tell me. Because if soon after that, I will go and I will destroy him and anything in my heart that will dare threaten the throne. So he tells them, go to Bethlehem. So what do they see? They see the star. And they start following the star. Remember that question that they asked him? The first question in the New Testament is from a man. And he says this, the wise men say, where is he, the Messiah, to be born, the King of the Jews? The, question, the first question in the New Testament is, where is the Messiah? You know what the first question in Old Testament is? Genesis 3, 9. Genesis 3, 9. God says, looking for Adam. Adam, where are you? Remember that? When he's hiding behind the bushes. The first question in Old Testament, God's looking for man. The whole Old Testament embodies the idea of God looking for a lost humanity. He's looking at us saying, where are you? You're lost in sin. The New Testament flips it over, isn't it? Now we have a sinful man asking where are you, God? You see that? Isn't that unbelievable? So they ask the question, where is God? And if there's anybody in this church today who's honestly and seriously seeking God, you will have to be led to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is God. There's a very funny story I heard. About a Sunday school class, the teachers tell the kids in the class, listen, you guys can do your own Christmas pageant. So they can do anything they want. Just as you see it, it's beautiful and beautiful scene. They can do anything they want. So they read them the story out of the Bible and they said, okay, here's a couple of props. Go wild. Cock blanche. Yes, he said, do what you want. So a little girl ran forward, grabbed a doll and said, I'll be Mary. Another one said, I'll be Joseph. Another one grabbed a bathrobe and said, I'll be a shepherd. And so on and so on. Eventually, all of them was either lamb or wise man or shepherd. And then eventually there was one little girl over. She didn't have a role. So she said, I'll be the doctor. He said, don't be a doctor. He's going to deliver the baby Jesus, right? I don't, know, I don't know where the doctor is over here. They missed that completely. She says, I'll be the doctor. So the story goes, they go to the inn, they get kicked out, and they go to the manger. So now it's time for the birth of Jesus. So this little girl runs out as a doctor. She pulls the dog out from under Mary's uh, pillow that she had in her, in her shirt. She lifts it up to the sky. Next to her was Joseph. Joseph, the excited father. He says, well, Doc, what is it? The little girl is a doctor, looks at the baby, and she says, well, don't you know, it's a God. As funny as that story is, it's true. This little girl understood more about theology than most people do. The simple fact that Jesus Christ is God. The only reason we say today is because He is God. Did you get that? No one must walk out this church today thinking that this is a good man, a rabbi, or teacher. Jesus Christ was 100% and fully God. And when He came down, He was conceived with the Holy Spirit of God. You see that word there? And because He was born of Mary, a woman, He was 100% human. That is the only reason why Jesus Christ would qualify to save you and us. No one else in the world, in the history of the universe, not Napoleon, not the Popes, not all the ministers, not Joel Austin and Graham, um, uh, what's that guy? Um, Billy Graham, not none of them. I love Billy Graham, by the way. Cool minister, really awesome. <laughs> But none of them could do what Jesus did. Why? Because they weren't God. It was only a person that could be born of God, from the Holy Spirit of God, that could come and take the holy hand of God the Father and the sinful man of humanity and bring them together. Because Jesus is God. So there the babe was born in the manger and the three wise men followed the star and stopped. They came to the manger and they walked in and they had gifts. Anybody know what those gifts were? Xbox and bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> what else did baby Jesus want? I heard, this, I heard this joke about these two boys that went to their grandparents the week before Christmas. The weekend before Christmas. So that night they knelt 
beside their bed and they decided to pray. So the little one prayed at the top of his lungs. He said, Dear God, I want an Xbox, a bicycle, and a skateboard. So his bigger brother nudged him and said, Listen, you don't have to shout. God is not dead. He said, I know, but Grandma is. <laughs> Remember that next time, kids. <laughs> no, they didn't bring an Xbox. They brought gold, frankincense, and moan. And now these years were very, very purposeful, very, very particular to Jesus Christ and the role that he would play. The gold represented Jesus as the king. It was gold fit for a king. It was a tribute of many ancient times when you, when you brought the gift to the king. It would always be gold. Gold represents Jesus Christ's role as the king. And he was. Even the wise men came. The first words they said in the New Testament was, Where is he to be born the king of the Jews? In John 12, Palm Sunday, when Jesus is coming riding in a donkey, the people shout to Hosanna, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. The whole Old Testament embodies the fact that Jesus Christ was coming as the Messiah, and the Messiah would be the king of Israel, the king of the Jews. And this is what Jesus said himself. When they asked him, well, are you the king of the Jews? He said, you say that I am. He proclaimed that he was the king. But did the Jews accept him as the king? No. They crucified him. They put him on a cruel cross and said, that is not our king. That is not our Messiah. But then Jesus, hanging on that cross, bleeding to death for the salvation of mankind, said, forgive them, Father. Forgive them. For they don't know what they're talking about. And you know what? What's the game the Jews? And then he said, his Holy Spirit, Acts 2, Holy Spirit comes down, the apostles endowed with great gifts and powers, and they go around preaching to Jesus and the Son. They continue. And so listen, Israel, repent of your sins because Jesus is coming back. And he's going to set up his kingdom. He's the king. Accept him as the king. And did they accept him? No. Instead, they killed all the apostles. Starting with Stephen and Philip and then James and Peter, all the rest of them. Still to today, do the Jews accept Jesus as king? No. So the role that Jesus, that you play as king, is not yet fulfilled. It will be fulfilled in the future. When Jesus comes again in the second coming, He's going to come back, He's going to judge Israel for their faithlessness, for not believing Him, and then He will set up His kingdom. And then He will reign on this earth as the king of the Jews, just like the wise men said. If He's not the king, then what is He today? Well, that's where the second gift comes in. The second gift was frankincense, not Frankenstein. I always thought it was Frankenstein when I was growing up. And I thought, why would Jesus get Frankenstein? It doesn't make sense. <laughs> no, it was Frankenstein. Frankenstein is incense. It was only used by the high priest in the temple of Tabernacle. Very, very important gift. The first one was gold for a king, represented Jesus as a king. The second one was incense, represented Jesus Christ as the priest. Hebrews 6 says, Whether the forerunner is not ascended, even Jesus made a high priest of the order of Elizabeth. Currently, Jesus is not fulfilling his role as king, he's fulfilling his role as the high priest. Because after Jesus died and resurrected, he went up to the Father. And just like a high priest in the Old Testament, they would come into the Holy of Holies. They would present the blood before God. The only person, once a year, they would go to the Holy of Holies. And they present the blood to God, and God would see it, and we forgive the people of Israel. When Jesus Christ came down to this earth, He put Himself on the cross, and He became the sacrifice, once and for all. There's no need to go every year back into the temple, because Jesus has done it. So Jesus Himself went to God, presented Himself, and said, Here I am, Father. I am the sacrifice. And when Jesus looks at you and I, in all of our sin and mistakes and weaknesses, anybody here perfect? One or two of you? No. I see at the back, definitely not perfect. <laughs> we are not perfect. We have mistakes. And we are so lucky that we have Jesus on our side. Because Jesus is in heaven and he is like our lawyer, our advocate. No matter how many times we stuff up, Jesus steps in as our lawyer and says to God, listen, they are saved. They are holy. They are righteous. Not because of them, but because of the sacrifice that I have done. I am the high priest. There's no more sacrifice than I have done. There's no more high priest needed to go to the temple. I am here. I intercede for them. Isn't that wonderful to know that we have a lawyer on our side? And most lawyers, we know, are crooked, aren't they? Any lawyers here today? <laughs> Throw your gift back at me. <laughs> but, but Jesus isn't a crooked lawyer. And 
And you know what? For Jesus, you always wonder. No matter how bad and guilty you are, when Jesus steps up and defends you, you are winning. You are conquering. You redeem, you restore, you are righteous. Isn't that beautiful? I love that word about Jesus. And then that last one, that was called myrrh. Myrrh was a, a, a wicked gift to give a child. You know why? Because it was used in anointing the dead. It's a weird gift, isn't it? This is ointment they would use to rub the dead person to retard decompensation. To, the, 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 the body doesn't decompose. So that is like if you're having a baby, and you're having a baby shower, and I rock up and I give you a coffin. That's exactly what this was. <laughs> you can imagine her surprise as very beautiful Jesus just born in here. Somebody gives her a burial death. How do you think she felt? Probably the same as you would if I give you a coffin. So a shock. She said, the goal. And he says, I can understand. That's cool. Jesus is the king. Jesus is the priest. I've got it. But look, are you crazy? What are you giving word for? But as I said, they were purposeful. They gave it. I think God would name it. Maybe those wise men did not fully understand what the myrrh was for. Maybe even Mary did not know. But one thing was certain. The death of Jesus will be pivotal in his ministry. What do we celebrate today? The birth of Jesus. But you know what? Without the death of Jesus, we would not be here. It's not about the birth of Jesus. It's about his death. Because he was born to die. Have you heard that picture? We all born to die. Because we're born and we get old. And we die. But not Jesus. Jesus was born for the purpose to die. To save the world from their sin. That is what the murder represented. It represented his death would be the climax of his whole life. There's a beautiful song I came to know recently. Mary, did you know? Anybody know that song? Mary, did you know? It's a beautiful song. And it's about the same concept. It's a song saying, Mary, did you know that your baby Jesus would grow up? And one day, take the cruel cross. Mary, did you know that this little baby Jesus would be from and would be beaten and he'd be whipped for the sins of humanity? It's such a sad song, actually. And I can think of that. Think of Mary. Little Mary with Jesus. And his hand can just grasp around her little finger. You know what I mean? And she's looking at him. You think that those little chubby hands of Jesus would once be outstretched and there would be nails driven into it. Why? Because he died for us. Her hand was on his chest. And little Jesus was breathing up and down as a little baby. Do you think that one day those sides of Jesus would be torn because a Roman sword would pierce it and blood would come out? Why? Because he loves you and I so much that he would hang there until he died. Christmas is not about the birth of Christ. It's about his death. It's about his death. Because he came to die. We celebrate this day as his birth, but without the foreshadow of the cross, Christmas means nothing. That myrrh was the best gift, because in that one little gift that they gave to that baby Jesus, they said, Jesus, you are the king and you are the priest, but we know that your death is going to mean the world. And everyone here, sinners alike, we are saved not by his birth, we are saved by his death. Maybe a sad song to know for Christmas, isn't it? I don't mean to do that. I just mean to give you the reality of what Christmas is all about. It's not about the lights. It's not about Santa Claus. It's not about the guests. It's about Jesus. And my job, my role as a pastor, is not to get you gifts. If you don't want the gifts, give it back to me. <laughs> it's not about the gifts. It's not about Santa my role is to get you to Jesus. And just like the star of Bethlehem, you must do the same. That is your job. That is your role in life. You must be that bright shining star that leads people to Jesus. To the foot of the cross. Don't lead them to the manger. Lead them to the foot of the cross because that is where salvation comes. The gifts are fine. And I know gift giving is a big part of uh, Christmas. And you can probably think most of it comes from the wise men. It doesn't actually come from the wise men. There was a man born as a bishop in Turkey many, many, many years ago. And he was a bishop, a devout Christian. He loved the Lord. And his parents died and left him a lot of money. And as a man who wasn't very materially fervent, he didn't want things of the Lord. He decided to take this money and put gifts together. 
for the poor people in the community. His name was Saint Nicholas. So he done this. He put gifts together and he gave it to people without them knowing about it very anonymously. Until somebody saw him and said, hey, wait a minute. You are the Saint Nicholas. You're the bishop. And so the legend and myth of Saint Nicholas was carried from Turkey to Europe, to America. Saint Nicholas became Santa Claus. So the gifts actually come from a historical, very devout Christian way back in Turkey. But I know the gifts that the wise men bought, that they, they could not comprehend to any gift you can get today. The only gift I want you to concentrate on is the last one. Because that is the one that means most. The king will come, and the priest is now in heaven. But his death, it's all about his death. You and I have to shine brightly like stars. We are just pin holes in the curtain of night. And the brighter we shine, the more people will see us. And as you can see in the world we live in, Christians are not shining. That song that we started with, the last part, died us in that filthy land. You are the stars. When you leave this church, you need to shine brightly and lead the people out there to Jesus. There's serious, sad things happening in the world. Christians are being murdered, slaughtered, decapitated. Right now, as we speak, by the thousands in Syria. Where are the Christians? We're supposed to be shining brightly and leading them to Jesus. No, we've not seen it. We don't even see it riding through dispatch. Let alone in the outskirts of the world where we should be shining brightly. Let me leave you with this verse from Daniel. Daniel 12 says, Those who are wise will shine as bright as the sun. And those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever. Let that be your declaration, let that be your prayer. Let that be the Holy Spirit moving in your heart today. You walk out this church shining like stars forever as you bring many people to righteousness. Your righteousness, no, to the righteousness of Christ. So today, we leave this church with a new understanding of what Christmas is all about. It's a time for merrymaking and fellowship, isn't it, for this one? You can't wait to get home, dead and egg That's deep in about Jesus. It's about what He's done for us. So as you leave this church, have that understanding that this is a time when we represent, where we see Jesus and we know that He came to this earth as a babe in a manger. But the babe in a manger was there to the hill of Calvary. Amen. Amen. Let us sing out.